Okay, can we start? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome. I'm glad that uh, you all can join us. So let me just take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge the uh, presence of a few distinguished guests. Uh, Philip Romualdis, Chairman of MSD Management. Uh, Rolly Estabilio, Publisher of The Standard. And of course, Babe Romualdis, the President of the MOPC. Uh, today marks another milestone in the uh, standards legacy as the authoritative source of in information and opinion on topics. Continuing on that mission and vision of the standard to broaden its reach and in keeping with the new trends in technology and information consumption, today we are introducing the standard talks. Now, this is our latest innovation in our content dissemination uh, uh, drive. The vision of the standard talks is really to have a monthly forum in order to enlighten audiences on hot and burning issues that are in the news and uh, that is being discussed in uh, the public. We hope that these, this forum will be able to enter to uh, enlighten everybody on the issues whether you're pro or you're against, or just simply seeking for information, uh, the standard talks will hopefully be the authoritative venue for you to learn everything you, you want to know about any particular issue. Today, we're gonna deal on the Bank Samoro Basic Law, and we hope that our distinguished panelists, which our uh, moderator and editor-in-chief will later introduce, We'll hope to enlighten everyone, uh, our audience, and be able to understand everything there is to know about the BBL. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our editor-in-chief, uh, Jojo Robles. Thank you, Mr. Arnold Young. Good afternoon to the distinguished members of our panel, to our distinguished guests, members of the staff of the Standard, and uh, the first Standard Talks is about the hot and burning issue of the day, which is the Bang Samoro Basic Law. I'd like to introduce the people who sit on our panel today not only to our audience here, but also those, to those people watching us via the internet. First off, I'd like to introduce uh, the chairman of the government of the Philippines Peace Negotiating Panel with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. She uh, graduated from the University of the Philippines with a degree in philosophy, cum laude in 81. She possesses master's degrees from the Southeast Asian, or in Southeast Asian Studies from the University of Kent and Canterbury. She was also director of the UP Third World Studies Center and a convener of the Program on Peace democratization and human rights at the UP Center for Integrative and Development Studies until 2005. Before she joined the Government Peace Panel as an advisor in 2010, she was already involved in a number of campaigns and is an expert in the field of conflict resolution. She was also involved in a Nobel Peace Prize winning campaign against landlines and fact-finding missions investigating human rights abuses in Cambodia and Nepal, and her work subsequently earned her a Nobel Peace Prize nomination in the year 2005. Without further ado, well, she replaced, uh, she assumed her current post in 2012, replacing a former UP College of Law Dean Marvick Leonen, who was appointed 
to the Supreme Court. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Chairman Miriam Cornell Ferrer. Our other panelist is a former, is a uh, uh, Filipino entrepreneur and a certified public accountant. He is the first non-American Dole general manager in uh, Costa Rica and the Philippines, and he served as Secretary of Agriculture, where he was named Most Outstanding Cabinet Member. He currently serves as the President of Ultrex Management and Investment Corporation. Born in Guagua, Pampanga, Secretary and now member of the Government Peace Panel as well, Secretary Senan Bakan. We also have, uh, from the Bangsamoro Transition Commission, uh, a former uh, program, Moro Program Coordinator and uh, uh, member of the uh, Alternative Legal Assistance Center, advocate of Muslim women's rights. Uh, she was uh, uh, also a researcher and publications officer and women's unit coordinator of the Mindanao branch, coordinator and executive director, and has been involved in uh, women's, uh, particularly Muslim women's uh, rights, the, the women's uh, Muslim rights movement. Uh, I'd like to introduce Attorney Raisa Jajuri. and also an alternative member of the MILF Peace Panel since uh, 2010. Uh, he has been a, he was a member of the, and later chairman of the MILF Technical Committee, a graduate of BS Military Science, 1965 from the Cairo Military Academy, from Basilan, and of uh, Sama Bangingi Tausug descent, we have Honorable Abdullah Kamlian. Now to serve as moder co-moderators and to help us gain uh, insights on the continuing controversy that is the Bangsamoro Basic Law, we have also invited, and they sit on the other side of the table, my good friend and co-radio host on WIZ, Karambola, uh, longtime journalist and since uh, 2009. 2009, a member of the House of Representatives representing the Abacada Party List. We have my friend, Jonathan De La Cruz. And a UP professor and uh, uh, columnist also of the, of the Standard. And uh, I have to admit that I admire his work, even if... Uh, it doesn't come out as often as it should, in my opinion. And maybe we'll remedy that. We have uh, Professor Chito Avicilia. And then we have a longtime Malacanang reporter of the Standard, uh, former president of the Malacanang Press Corps, currently city editor of the Standard, to uh, Professor Avicilia's uh, left is Joyce Panco Pañares. Our format is really simple. We'll be talking about that more later. It'll be like a modified press conference where the uh, panelists will be on the right, on my right, will be asked questions by the people on the left. It's not going to be a debate. We're not here to debate. We're here to enlighten people. Meanwhile, may I request everyone to stand up for the national anthem.
maybe we'll just sing the national anthem. Okay, uh, forgive my singing voice, but if you'll all join in, it'll drown out my ugly voice. Okay, all together now. Payang magilid, first na sinahanan, alam ng puso, sa higit mo'y buhay, lupang hirap, luya ka ng mabiging, sa manunupi, di ka pa sisihin, sa dagat at mundo, sa simula, sa langit mong lugar, may dilagang tula at awit sa Lain na mahal, kamot sa kanwatan at mo'y tabi pa na naglilili. Ang ituwing at araw niya kailan sa may dilang bibili. Lubang ang araw ng wag at ipagsunta, buhay ay langit sa piling mo. Thank you very much. What we'd like to do here is to have the members of the government negotiating team and the uh, MILF negotiating panel express in, a, in a briefly but as comprehensively as they can their thoughts that they can share to our readers and to the people watching us through the internet what they really think right now about the Bangsamoro Basic Law and their and uh, and the con controversy that continues to to uh, hound the proposed law. So after giving each of them some time to tell us what they think, where we are right now, where's the roadmap, where are we going? We'd like to ask the people on the left to field questions that they can answer. Hopefully our audience and our readers and later on, perhaps the whole country will gain a better understanding of what's going on and enlighten the populace and unite us eventually instead of dividing us. I'd like to ask Chairman Ferrer to, uh, to do the honors, please. Madam Chairman, good afternoon. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the publisher of Manila Standard, Mr. Romualdez. Of course, our CEO, uh, Mr. Leong, and uh, editors and uh, joint members of the uh, Manila Standard. Um, Thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to engage you today uh, on, uh, on these matters that have, uh, uh, let's say, that, that has really confounded us. Uh, uh, for us in particular, the, the peace process has been going on for, um, under this administration from the very beginning of the term, it was a very important uh, um, component of the national policy that the administration has adopted. And, we saw the fruition of all of these uh, initiatives taking place last year when we signed the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro that was on March 27, 2014. And we have set off on the implementation phase. The whole agreement itself is made up of different components, uh, our most important component of which is precisely the, the matter of legislating the Bangsamoro Basic Law because it is this law that will put in place the political institutions that will uh, uh, be able to govern and uh, see through the process of uh, building peace and development and uh, of, uh, bringing to life as well the concept of uh, autonomy, regional autonomy that we find in our constitution. But then again, that is only one component of the comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro. We know that this is a historical problem. It is very complex. It is, in, it is operating in, the con in a context where you have diverse political, ethnic, social groupings and, uh, and uh, a situation of a severe underdevelopment uh, relative, uh, in terms of relative deprivation, comparative with other parts of the country and so on. And um, 
And that is why we have called this a comprehensive agreement precisely because it is not only about uh, legislating this Bangsamoro Basic Law, but although that is indeed uh, probably the most important political component, uh, it is also about uh, bringing about socioeconomic development in, uh, in the region that has been left behind by all human uh, human development indicators, uh, all, all components of the Human Development Index, and also uh, creating the environment for uh, addressing effectively all the security issues that pertain to these uh, areas, uh, meaning being able to quell criminality, uh, being able to disband the private armed groups, which is an important component in the Annex on Normalization, and of course, seeing through the transformation of the MILF from an armed revolutionary group into, uh, into an, uh, an, uh, a diverse forms of organization, a civic organization, a political party, where, uh, which can serve as their vehicle for uh, participation in elections as well as in governance, and uh, a social movement, but no longer the armed revolutionary group that it continues to be today. So we have the roadmap for that. There are several steps that will need to be undertaken simultaneous or parallel to the different initiatives, including other than the socioeconomic security and political components, a very important component that we call transitional justice and reconciliation. Because this is the heart of the, the, the process that addresses our social relationships with each other. The relationship between, for instance, the Filipino majority against a minority population that uh, has been defined as, uh, as um, somebody as the other to the Filipino majority, the other uh, that is distinguished by uh, uh, a different historical process. The, 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 the way that they have constructed their historical narrative is significantly different from the Filipino majoritarian narrative of our, of our history, and uh, also has been at the periphery, uh, not only in terms of geographic distance, but also in terms of all other political, social, cultural processes of, of the nation that has been largely centered here in, in Manila. So transitional justice and reconciliation precisely hopes to rebuild that kind of a relationship that has been destroyed in terms of how we look at each other and how we view each other and how we hope to coexist peacefully together as one nation. Uh, and uh, uh, that remains to be implemented along with all the other components. Uh, and that is why as far as uh, your peace negotiators are concerned, it is a, imperative for us to see that uh, the political process moves forward so that all the other components can also fall into place and we are able to achieve that kind of uh, transformation uh, based on the reforms that have been uh, stipulated and that transformation can be the uh, you know can serve as some kind of a foundation for that for a much much better socio-economic political arrangement in the region and a much better appreciation of each other between the Filipino majority and uh, these, uh, the, the people who have called themselves uh, Bangsamoro. So I think uh, that is just a brief overview. Uh, just to add a little bit on the global perspective, which I had really wanted to address for today. One of the questions that we do need to address is, uh, uh, or maybe some kind of conundrum that I would like to pose to everyone, why is it if the, the peace process and our initiative now to continue through the BBL is uh, so much maligned in our country and yet the peace process, including the passage of uh, a very good uh, autonomy law, is something that has been celebrated in the rest of the world? The other corollary question is that if we are dealing with a terrorist organization, if we've dealt with people whom we do not really know, how come despite all these difficulties that we have seen in the aftermath of the Mama Sapano, the international community continues to be behind this process. And I think a, a better appreciation of what's going on around the world today can inform, inform us why uh, uh, 
foreign governments, multilateral institutions are fully behind the, this, uh, the whole process. And that, is precise, that precisely has to do with the kinds of conflicts that we're seeing in other parts of the world. Uh, what, is, uh, what has become apparent in the second decade of the 21st century is this significant rise in violent conflicts uh, in Africa, in the Middle East, um, and uh, also in some parts of East Europe, uh, as you know. And all of these conflicts now are being sought to be resolved precisely through political negotiations. I mean, uh, you have talks going on right now in Myanmar with the different ethnic groups just at the very beginning where they have, uh, after 16 months of negotiation, finally produced a draft ceasefire agreement. We have had our ceasefire agreement since 1997, and it is that same ceasefire agreement that we are, have been defending and protecting now with all its mechanisms and protocols. Um, because we, we believe that that has been a very important uh, component that has led us to this political, uh, political solution that is now framed around the comprehensive agreement on the Bang Samoro. In uh, other parts of the world, negotiations still continue. They have restarted, they have failed. Uh, whereas in others, uh, there seem to be no hope of right now of achieving uh, uh, a peaceful resolution. Uh, we have the situation in Syria, the rise of the ISIL group, a very significant increase according to the Global Terrorism Index in uh, terrorist activities, for instance, beginning especially in 2013. And we had contributed to that in 2013. If you remember in 2013, we had the Lahad Dato incident, the Samwanga siege, a lot of Abu Sayyaf uh, activities uh, along the lines of kidnappings and uh, as well as uh, the BIFF, which launched uh, several hundreds of uh, uh, hostile attacks against the Philippine military and civilian communities during this year. So it wasn't, it is, wasn't surprising to find that we landed number nine in the Global Terrorism Index. I mean, it, it is something indeed that, uh, that, uh, con uh, that is uh, very, very uh, real, to, real to us that we are able to find a resolution to these uh, threats that we face now. And this peace agreement with the MILF is one such peaceful resolution that if we are able to sustain it, then uh, we are able to, uh, to undercut the undercut, uh, to be able to undercut uh, the growth of all the different uh, other organizations with uh, a much, much more radical, radical orientation, that's number one, and also to bring to the fold uh, several thousands, tens of thousands of uh, members of the MILF who are actually now willing to go back to the fold uh, on the basis of justice and the basis of uh, certain reforms that would allow them to meaningfully participate in the nation's politics. So I won't go too much into the details, but uh, I hope that I am able to provide that kind of uh, an overview uh, as, an, as, uh, as my introduction to this uh, forum. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman. And we'd like to hear now from Secretary Sinan Bakani. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to clarify some of the salient points of the proposed Bangsamoro Basic Law. I'm the only other member of the panel left uh, from the original panel of five, which was uh, organized by President Aquino in July 2010. Before we started negotiations, we had four guidelines from the President. First, work within the flexibilities of the Constitution. Learn from lessons of the past. Do not promise what we cannot deliver, meaning up to June 30, 2016. Be transparent and inclusive. Throughout all of these negotiations, we have always considered those uh, four basic instructions. Uh, during the last four and a half years, we had 24 rounds of exploratory talks uh, with the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, uh, ranging from three days to a week. Uh, Easily, it's at least 100 panel days. Uh, it has not been a walk in the park because uh, we have had to negotiate 
with all of the different departments of government, uh, including their subunits, uh, because there's a lot of details to be negotiated uh, with regard to this comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro. The comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro was used as the basis for drafting the Bank Samoro basic law. So they're not exactly the same because it was, uh, the proposed Bank Samoro basic law was drafted by uh, an all Bank Samoro transition commission, learning from the lessons of the past because previous laws have been drafted by a Congress predominantly Christian. So we took the other extreme in terms of having it drafted uh, by an o o almost all Bank Samoro uh, transition commission. There there's only one exception. Uh, no, there's basically uh, exceptions of, we had representatives from the Christian settlers as well as the indigenous peoples. I said Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia because People have been asking, why is Malaysia facilitating this? Uh, again, we have tried to clarify that from the start. Our former president requested the then uh, Prime Minister Mahathir if Malaysia can act as the facilitator after the all-out war in the year 2000. I think in order to resume negotiations, I guess there were discussions in terms of at least this time around to have a facilitator. It was at that time that the then President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo requested the then Prime Minister Mahathir if uh, Malaysia could serve as the facilitator and they agreed. That's basically the history. Uh, second thing also we want to correct, international monitoring team, it does not report to Malaysia, it reports to the panels of the government as well as the MILF. Uh, just like the report of the international monitoring team, we were given, it was given to us with the copy to the facilitator. Because some are asking, why is the report being sent to Malaysia? We said, no, it's not true. The international monitoring team is based in Cotabato City. Uh, it's composed the, of uh, citizens of Malaysia, Brunei, Norway, Japan, Indonesia, and the European Union. Uh, six countries represented in the international monitoring team. Only, thing, only other thing I want to clarify before I end this. There's been a lot of talk about the Bank Samoro being given 70 billion, 75 billion. We have always tried to say by whatever computation we, we can arrive at, the incremental funding is between seven to 10 billion a year, depending on the interpretation. Because most of the numbers being cited will continue anyway, even without the Bank Samoro Basic Law. Of course, you will have an in internal revenue allotment of the local government units. Of course, you will have uh, the existing subsidy of, to the arm. Of course, you will have uh, national agencies spending in the arm, just like in any other region. Uh, because sometimes when it gets repeated so often, people think it's, it's a fact. It's between seven to 10 billion a year, depending on the interpretation. Is it worth it? Just when I just look at, again, you cannot value human suffering or death, but even just from a purely uh, number standpoint, when I look at the Department of Defense national budget of 100 billion, we know that a lot of that's being spent in Mindanao. I think easily we can direct that 7 to 10 billion to external threats uh, if, uh, if at some point we would have lasting peace in Mindanao. Uh, but really that's not, the, the bigger one is the opportunity loss. Uh, when you look at the estimates of economists, uh, they say that if, uh, if at some point we have just in lasting peace in Mindanao, you can have an increase in our economic growth from 0.3 of 1% to 1%. Since we'll, we're a 12 trillion peso economy, 0.3 of 1% 
is easily 36 billion pesos. I'm trying to look at that in terms of opportunity loss. Uh, when you look at, is it worth in, to incrementally fund 7 to 10 billion a year? We're saying, just in terms of actual expenses of government without putting a value in terms of human suffering and death, it's worth it. Put together the opportunity loss, I don't think there is any question that it's worth it. BBL, of course, you, you cannot legislate peace. So we're just trying to create the environment so that we will have a, a road uh, which will lead us to a just and lasting peace. It's just a vital component. Uh, you can never legislate peace. Uh, it's uh, not an overnight process. It takes time. Uh, what we're basically saying is uh, this proposed Bangsamoro Basic Law is very vital in leading us towards a just and lasting peace in Mindanao. Thank you, Secretary. Now we'd like to hear from uh, Attorney Jajuri. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting us and for giving us the opportunity to talk about the Bank Samoro Basic Law outside of the halls of uh, Congress. Um, as you all know, the, the BBL uh, is a product of 17 years of negotiations, but more directly, it is also the product of a commission, the Bank Samoro Transition Commission, which guided by the pertinent provisions of the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bank Samoro, uh, drafted this bill after consul many consultations with uh, the many stakeholders of, uh, of, of the law, uh, not only inside the territory of the Bank Samoro, but as well as outside. And after we drafted the um, the bill. This was further discussed uh, with um, the Office of the President as well as with the panels of the government and the MILF. And what we have right now, which is um, uh, the same version that is filed in the House and the Senate, uh, would be the agreed version of the bill. Um, so we can say that it embodies what is in the agreement, it embodies the aspirations of the Bank Samoro uh, for uh, development, for peace in our community. Um, what we appeal for right now is um, a more intelligent, a more dispassionate discussion of the merits of the bill. Uh, we think that uh, the way that discussions are going uh, both inside um, Congress as well as in the public, um, discredits uh, the many things that are found in the basic law that would help us move the peace process forward. So if we take out the singular incident of Mama Sapano, uh, the challenge is really to look at what we have right now, the ARMM, uh, the failures and the successes of the arm, what can we put in a law that would satisfy you know, people who have been clamoring for more than autonomy, but who have settled for autonomy. Um, so this is now in, in the House, but we need uh, public support, public support that can translate uh, to votes uh, among the members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to hear now from the fourth member of our uh, group uh, of proponents of the BBL, the Honorable Kamlian. Good afternoon and assalamu alaikum to all of you. As a founding member of the MNLF, we thought at that time we should separate the Muslim nations from the Republic of the Philippines. At that time, we were young. We felt that this country do not serve us. This country do not take care of us. And this country will never give us any, anything for development of, human, of our humanity. And therefore, 
we organize the MNLF. Our sole aim was to establish an, and return our nation to the old Bangsamoro sovereign nation, before that sovereign Moro nations before the coming of the Republic of the Philippines. But then in 1974, there was this OIC conference in Kuala Lumpur, where the OIC countries requested us to tone down our demand from independence to autonomy. Out of our respect to our supporters in the OIC countries as brothers in faith, we relented and we agreed, provided we should have that genuine autonomy. So that in 1976, there was this Tripoli Agreement signed in Tripoli, Libya, for which an autonomy was supposed to be established in Southern Philippines. But that autonomy, instead of one autonomy, there was two regional autonomies, which is not in accord with the 1976 agreement. And because of that, the late Chairman Salamat who was then vice chairman of the MNLF, organized the MILF in 1977, and continued the struggle for independence of the Bangsamoro. To cut long story short, even then, Chairman Salamat agreed later on that to resolve the conflict in Mindanao, there should be a dialogue between the MILF and the Republic of the Philippines, and therefore the negotiation went ahead. Now, out of this negotiation, the framework agreement and the uh, comprehensive agreement were signed, and the Bangsamoro Transition Commission was organized in view of that uh, agreement, two agreements, and to inform this body that the BBL, the Bangsamoro Basic Law, is not solely the product of the MILF, but it is a joint undertaking done by both representatives of the MILF and the representatives of the Philippine government. There were eight MILF representatives in the BTC, uh, two of us uh, with attorney Raisa Jajuri plus uh, six others, and there are seven members coming from the Philippine side. The BBL is not also solely done by these 15 representatives, but this is a product of consultations done in Mindanao, in the Visayas, and also here in Metro Manila. And I remember there, is, there was one public uh, hearing in uh, Vigan, in Olocos. We have accepted the idea of autonomy and as not being a lawyer, I could not understand why the Mama Sapano incident is equated with the BBL. It is quite disturbing to, to my person, especially uh, maybe for reason, maybe because I cannot understand why Mama Sapano incident is equated with the BBL, when there were so many lives that perished during this 42 years of struggle of the Bangsamoro. There were not only 44 persons that died in this struggle, there were thousands of people that died in this struggle. And uh, anyway, 
Uh, we just want to appeal to to the media to be fair enough. We do not ask for more, but just give us a fair uh, reporting uh, so that we can educate the public on what is the BBL all about. Thank you and wassalam. Thank you very much. Now we'd like to go directly to the questions that our panelists on the other side, media people, representatives of the standard and friends of the standard in case of Congressman <coughs> De La Cruz. Uh, anyone who has any questions can just shoot them right away. But I mean, no right. shooting, just shoot a question. Marayong uh, salamat, <laughs> Jojo. Thank you, thank you. Actually, as uh, you mentioned, uh, we came here to listen, to uh, find out uh, what is really the heart of our panelists. Uh, and we thank them for uh, giving us the time to uh, hear their uh, sentiments as well as their uh, contributions to uh, the uh, framing of uh, the Bangsamoro Basic Law. There are just certain things that we wanted to make sure that uh, we understand so that uh, we will have a uh, <clears throat> uh, better appreciation of what is happening right now. Uh, and I'm not talking here as a member of Congress. I'm just uh, uh, talking here as uh, a, a, an observer, having been uh, involved in uh, many of the things that uh, the panelists have mentioned regarding uh, the efforts uh, to find uh, peace, uh, just and lasting peace in, uh, in uh, Mindanao. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, um, make sure that I understand what they're telling us, including uh, the uh, so-called uh, failure of uh, the uh, uh, efforts, the peace efforts in, uh, in Mindanao. I have to... Uh, disagree with that kind of an assessment because it leads to a lot of other uh, arrangements that can impinge on the manner by which we are supposed to be working on the peace process. And uh, that has actually uh, engendered a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, static in the manner by which these discussions have happened. Because, uh, for example, we've been hearing uh, BBL equals uh, war without, uh, no BBL equals war. BBL equals peace. Uh, we have to do these things, otherwise we will have all of these uh, bloody scenarios, etc., and all of these things. These things have created a number of static, and it is not wise for us to continue working on that basis. Even the issue of Mama Sabano. I don't want to discuss the issue of Mama Sapano because uh, that, is not, uh, that is not going to be very healthy, although it provides us a window into uh, uh, what is happening right now into the mindset of uh, people we are supposed to be partnering as far as the peace process is concerned. I am, of course, I don't want to question the uh, uh, identity of uh, uh, Mr. Iqbal. Uh, that, is not the, that is not the issue. Uh, the main point that we would like to find out are the things that, they would, uh, that uh, we would like to uh, be reassured upon. Number one, if uh, the uh, panel, as well as the administration right now, believes that uh, the ARMM has been a failure, we have to be, uh, we have to be sure that uh, they can give us, uh, number one, where have we failed? Number two, what kind of failures are these? And we would like to, we would like to know whether this particular failures leads us to a situation where we are going to come out with an, a, 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 a new, entirely new, uh, basic law, because there is already a basic law for uh, uh, Muslim Mindanao. And this has been expanded in the sense uh, during the uh, administration of uh, former President uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. So we would like to find out. If you say that it is a failure, where have you failed? What kind of failures are these? What are we going to do with this thing? Uh, is, the fail uh, is this failure so, so uh, uh, problematic to the point that we now have to come out with a new structure? A new arrangement, and uh, it cannot be it cannot be in any manner or form work out within the framework of the existing organic act. So that is one uh, arrangement that we would like to find out from the panelists. The other thing that uh, we, we had wanted to clear up in this discussion, uh, 
is uh, the idea of having this uh, comprehensive agreement on the Bangsamoro. And I was discussing this with uh, Professor Ferrer and Secretary Bagani earlier because uh, the impression that we are getting from a number of people, including those who are for the BBL, is that if the BBL is not going to be passed in its entirety, meaning as is, then everybody will go back, meaning the MILF or the other leaders of the MILF, will go back to the comprehensive agreement on uh, the Bangsamoro, which, the, which can then be waived as an executive agreement or an agreement that has been signed in the presence of uh, uh, foreign dignitaries. And therefore, can be uh, likened, and this is what we would like to uh, ask them later on, at least, uh, at least uh, to inform us and educate us, can be likened to the arrangement that happened in Kosovo. And that is one thing that is, you know, that is uh, putting us in a lot of problems, even in the House. Because in the case of Kosovo, and I think uh, Professor Ferrer and Secretary Bakani and the panelists themselves, Mr. Kamlian and uh, Tony the jury, we agree. Uh, there was an arrangement that happened in Kosovo. And uh, the, uh, we are afraid, a number of us are afraid that we are going through that process. And if there are certain, as uh, has been mentioned earlier by Professor Ferrer herself and uh, Mr. Kamlian, if there are certain radical elements within uh, the organization of the MILF, we might get into the situation where we will no longer have a, a uh, unitary country, a, uh, a, a, a Philippine Republic, but a uh, sub-state. And this has been mentioned even by some of our members in the, in the Senate and in the House. We are actually creating a situation where we are going to have a Kosovo in our, in our midst. So these are some of the things that we would like to work on. And then, of course, when the Mama Sapano uh, incident uh, happened, we have to take a look at the manner by which the BBL will now address problems of this nature. And we are looking at the intergovernmental mechanisms that is provided for under the BBL. And we think that these are inadequate. And as a matter of fact, the experience that we had in the case of Mama Sapano has proven so. And then, of course, the problem that was mentioned earlier about finance, about the economy, and all of these things. So these are some of the things that uh, have to be looked into properly, aside from the constitutionality issue, because the constitutionality issue will have to be discussed by Attorney Abisilla, because I am not a lawyer. I'm just trying to uh, uh, gauge what is uh, happening right now as far as the law is concerned. But there are certain problems that have uh, something to do, a lot uh, of things to do with uh, the, legal, the legal precepts as well as the wording of uh, the BBL itself. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier to Professor Ferrer and Secretary Bakani, uh, the BBL, it appears to many of us, mirrors the MOA AD, which is the Memorandum of Agreement on the Ancestral Domain, which was declared unconstitutional by the Philippine Supreme Court uh, earlier. So these are some of the things that we would like to look into. And as I said, we came here to be informed and educated, and we would like to be we would like, uh, we will be very, very happy if this can be, these things can be properly addressed uh, at some point in time because uh, we are now in the process of winding down the issue of Mama Sapano and getting into the discussions about the Bangsamoro Basic Law. So I will now request, if, with the permission of uh, the moderator, uh, Attorney Abisilia, to, take, uh, to give us an idea regarding the uh, constitutionality and other legal issues. You go ahead. Thank you, Thank you Congressman. Um, first, uh, thank you for this opportunity to address this uh, assembly, and uh, I hope um, I don't sound too legalistic, but uh, we, can't uh, we can't avoid it because we are going to discuss uh, legal issues. Uh, actually, the, very, the pertinent provision of all the discussion will center on the Constitution, whether we like it or not. It's uh, Article 10 of the 1987 Constitution, which provides for autonomous regions, take note, autonomous regions. So while uh, resort to motherhood statements like uh, the BBL will unite our people and we need peace, etc., all of those become uh, largely uh, inconsequential when we take into account that the BBL is pending before the two houses of Congress and the task of Congress is to legislate, which is to enact laws. And of course, Congress does not want its uh, laws declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So it is all a matter of law. So having established that, 
There is a principle called stare decisis. Several years back in North Cotabato versus Government of the Republic of Philippines, in a decision of the Supreme Court and Bank, penned by uh, Justice um, Carpio Morales, the uh, Memorandum of uh, Agreement on Cecil Domain was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And as uh, Congressman De La Cruz uh, mentioned, it, was, it, it reflects, or the BBL reflects uh, that uh, MOA AD. Take note that the MOA AD used the term, the relationship between the Bangsamoro legal entity and the government of the Republic of the Philippines was associative. This was struck down categorically by the court as uh, an attempt to dismember the Republic of the Philippines. So the associative relationship was disallowed. Interestingly, the BBL does not use that word for good reason because it was uh, unconstitutional. It uses now another uh, term. That term is asymmetric relationship. Whatever the uh, nomenclature uh, used here, it is clearly something outside or is something uh, far higher than mere autonomy, which the Constitution allows. We won't even say the Constitution guarantees it because the Constitution merely permits autonomy. And when uh, you're talking about autonomy, it is very clear that it is not self-government, but simply the kind of government that is uh, not uh, subject to certain restrictions made available to other ordinary governments. We'll get into that uh, a little uh, later. So the BBL uses asymmetric relationship. Justice Vicente Mendoza, a noted constitutional law expert in, uh, who retired from the Supreme Court, pointed this out also. The asymmetric relationship is no different from the word associative, as used in associative relationship in the MOA AD. Next, before the, uh, before the BBL was enacted, even before the Transition Commission was uh, created, the, um, we know that Congress is dominated by the Liberal Party, and the Liberal Party is uh, led by President Aquino, and the Liberal Party came up with a law synchronizing the ARMM elections with the national elections. And we could read in the media at the time that the President was all out in support of the ARMM. This is our uh, key to development in uh, Mindanao, our key to peace, etc. That uh, law was challenged by many parties in the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court sustained it. Now, what we can understand is, after just a few months, the president makes a complete about face and says, the ARMM is a failed experiment. Take note, from uh, a partner in progress and peace in Mindanao to a failed experiment, that is a complete turnaround, which at the very least, the president of the Philippines must explain before he urges his political allies in Congress to replace the ARMM. The power to amend the, the law is conceded because that is political power. But political power must be tempered by the Constitution. And the Supreme Court may strike down any law even if it's attended with grave abuse of discretion. The Constitution does not even say that it has to be unconstitutional. As long as that uh, law is attended with grave abuse of discretion, the Supreme Court in its constitutionally mandated Duty, not right, not power, but a duty, can <coughs> strike it down. The Constitution also requires the participation of a regional consultative commission in the enactment of an organic act. The BBL's uh, purpose is to replace the ARMM uh, organic act. Look at what the, so the Constitution says. The Congress shall enact an organic act for each autonomous region with the assistance and participation of the regional consultative commission composed of representatives appointed by the president from a list of nominees from multi-sectoral bodies. That did not happen in this case. The Transition Commission is uh, not even uh, authorized by the Constitution. In fact, even the Transition Commission's creation is unconstitutional because the president does not have the power to create public office. The authority here is Biraugo versus uh, Philippine Truth Commission. I uh, lawyered for uh, Mr. Biraugo there. And the Supreme Court said that the only instance when the president can actually sort of create a public office is only when the executive exercising the power under Section 17 needs to find out if the laws are faithfully executed. That cannot be invoked to justify the BBL here because the president is not creating, he did not create an agency 
to see that the laws are faithfully executed because the creation of the Transition Commission and the others after that is not by legislative fiat but pure executive discretion. Therefore, the creation from the very beginning is not only unlawful but unconstitutional. Con the Constitution also calls for autonomous regions. It is in bold face in the Constitution. This is a copy uh, officially published by the Supreme Court. <coughs> autonomous regions. The term region here necessarily excludes the use of the term territory. So when the Constitution uses regions, it means something short of a territory because the territory is a fundamental element of statehood. We have learned in early political uh, science classes that it is an element of statehood. Take note that there is no mention of the word territory in that sense under the Constitution, but autonomous region. Then I, your intention is invited to the ordinance attached to the Constitution, approved also in a plebiscite, a nationwide plebiscite, which divides the country into different regions. So if a, uh, an, a part of the republic is to, divide, to be divided into certain areas, it must follow the concept of regions, not territory. And that is clear from the constitutional intention when the drafters use the term autonomous region. We understand that the constitutional uh, commissioners who drafted the constitution have argued that uh, for them the BBL is in accord with what they had in mind. We beg to disagree. First and foremost, there is a uh, gray area here in the Constitution, which the Constitutional Commissions, them, the Commissioners themselves, created. And under the fundamental principles of constitutional law, all doubts must be resolved against those responsible for that uh, unclear area. If the Constitutional Commission of 1986 had intended that this should, should be allowed, then they should have said so clearly in the Constitution. But because they used the uh, language which the voters understood to mean as autonomous regions when they went to the plebiscite, the opinion of the Constitutional uh, Commission will not hold water over what the electorate has had in mind when they troop to the plebiscite and cast their ballots. The Supreme Court has categorically ruled that. The argument that the people who do drafted the law is applicable if you are interpreting statutes or enactments of Congress. But when you are interpreting provisions of the Constitution, uh, that's something else. The, prim the primary considerations there, what did the people, the sovereign Filipino people have in mind when they ratified the 87th Constitution in the plebiscite? And it's very clear the Constitution says regions not territory. There is the, BB, the basic law also does not uh, provide for COA audit of expenditures, which is also unconstitutional because under Article 90 of the Constitution, all public money shall be subject to government audit. Next point. If you look at the provisions of the BBL, this is a prelude to independence of uh, the MILF. We have the... We have no, I have no quarrel with the MILF. Uh, it, this is for academic uh, discussions. But suffice it to say that the MOAD, uh, which was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, uses the term, the uh, entity created by the MOA AD would be an integral and inseparable part of the Republic of the Philippines. Integral and inseparable part. N under the BBL, that phrase, integral and inseparable part of the republic, is conspicuously missing. All it says now is, the new entity will be part of the Republic of the Philippines. Uh, we know, uh, well, no, I don't like to say we know. In constitutional interpretation, the conspicuous elimination of an important provision uh, suggests that the intention is to clearly dispense with that. So supposing this is what the Constitution used to say, and you eliminate it, then the provision, it means that they don't want to have that provision. Applying that now to the BBL. Why is it that the phrase integral and inseparable part missing in the BBL? Next. 
A parliamentary setup is provided under the uh, BBL. Of course, while the Constitution does not prohibit a parliamentary setup, it goes against the constitutional intention of the 87 Constitution. Because, again, under the Constitution, take note, the, uh, the Organic Act shall define the basic structure of government for the region, the autonomous region, consisting of the executive department and legislative assembly. Take note, the Constitution went out of its way not just to say there shall be a government there or an autonomous government. That must provide for an executive department and a legislative assembly, which are, which are hallmarks of a presidential system. But suffice it to say that the MOAD, uh, which was declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court, uses the term, the uh, entity created by the MOA AD would be an integral and inseparable part of the Republic of the Philippines. Integral and inseparable part. N Under the BBL, that phrase, integral and inseparable part of the Republic, is conspicuously missing. All it says now is, the new entity will be part of the Republic of the Philippines. Uh, we know, uh, well, no, I don't like to say we know. In constitutional interpretation, the conspicuous elimination of an important provision uh, suggests that the intention is to clearly dispense with that. So supposing this is what the Constitution used to say, and you eliminate it, then the provision, it means that they don't want to have that provision. Applying that now to the BBL. Why is it that the phrase integral and inseparable part missing in the BBL? Next, a parliamentary setup is provided under the uh, BBL. Of course, while the Constitution does not prohibit a parliamentary setup, it goes against the constitutional intention of the 87 Constitution. Because, again, under the Constitution, take note, the, uh, the Organic Act shall define the basic structure of government for the region, the autonomous region, consisting of the executive department and legislative assembly. Take note, the Constitution went out of its way not just to say there shall be a government there or an autonomous government. That must provide for an executive department and a legislative assembly, which are, which are hallmarks of a presidential system. In a parliamentary setup, there is a merger of the executive and legislative uh, branches. We've seen that under the 1970 Constitution, although the Supreme Court declared it was a modified presidential system. Suffice it to say that the intention of the Constitution was to call for an autonomous re uh, government which works within the presidential uh, system. So a parliamentary, the parliamentary government provided under the BBL violates the spirit of the Constitution also. So the next point here is, again, under the Constitution, the president has the obligation to supervise the autonomous region. How can a president in a presidential system even supervise a government operating under a parliamentary uh, system? We, we, we wouldn't even know where to begin. Because for one thing, a parliamentary government presupposes the existence of a prime minister. And the prime minister can be removed at any time without an election, only by the powers of the members of parliament. How will the supervision be done here? Who will, who will have sway here? The prime minister of that uh, area or the president of the republic? And then there is no provision for, the, the, the BBL allows for the provision of inclusion. If you are uh, a contiguous uh, area and you want to be included in the plebiscite, you can file for inclusion. The problem is there is no provision for exclusion as pointed by, out by uh, Senator Ferdinand Marcos uh, Jr. How come we can, uh, we can join, but those who are forced by the, the law to join cannot uh, leave? Last we looked, that, uh, last we looked, there should be freedom of uh, choice. So, if the the if the BBL provides for a system of inclusion, 
it necessarily includes a provision for exclusion because the grant of power usually carries with it the opposite. So if you're going to illustrate it, the power to the constitutional right to speak up includes the constitutional right not to speak up. The constitutional right to listen to somebody includes the constitutional right not to listen. Why is it that there is only a provision for inclusion and no provision of exclusion? Next, the canvassing of ballots. This is rather disturbing because I read an article that uh, the canvassing of uh, ballots in the plebiscite will have a different application depending on whether the area has a dominant uh, Muslim population. That violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, which says that uh, no person shall be deprived of the equal protection of the laws. The Supreme Court in People versus Vera explained this to mean that people similarly situated should be treated similarly. Mm. We don't see why uh, there should be an equivalent way of canvassing ballots in the plebiscite, which brings us now to the uh, other uh, provision. The BBL does not, uh, does not uh, prohibit the establishment of religious schools under uh, the sponsorship of the government. That violates the principle of separation of church and state as well. Next, how can the BBL be enforced? First of all, uh, we do not know if the MILF really represents Muslim Mindanao. When we have, when we have somebody in the bargaining table, you cannot just simply say to the people that they, they represent uh, Muslim Mindanao. What do the others have uh, in mind? What if, let's say, a breakaway organization uh, comes out and says, we, are, uh, we have a bigger population than the MILF. How was the MILF uh, selected? Maybe the, the Transition Commission uh, did well. But the problem is how the MILF was chosen as the party is not disclosed to the public. And because of so much secrecy in the process, people get suspicious. Chito, and then Chito, the Chito oh. I hope you don't mind. No? Uh, I suggest uh, we go through the questions uh, one by one so the, right. so the uh, people on the other panel can, uh, can reply to them so we don't get lost in okay. trying to answer the questions that have already been fielded. I'm sorry, but personally, I, I think that would be a better format. If I'll that's okay. the decision of the moderator. Thank you. Um, uh, at this point, I'd like to ask the panel if and what questions you want to reply to that have already been fielded by Professor uh, Basilia and uh, who would like to answer the questions. Maybe I can start and then the rest of the panel can build on. So I won't be able to address all of the issues, uh, uh, I will start by saying, of course, we agree that Congress doesn't want its law to be debunked by the Supreme Court. And uh, that is also true for the president. We know very well that the president will have to sign into law uh, mm -hmm. this BBL. This is, after all, an urgent bill that has been certified before Congress. And uh, uh, doing so, I don't think that uh, constitutes any abuse, grave abuse of discretion on the part of the president that is very m much recognized as part of this kind of uh, relationship between the, uh, between the legislative branch and the, uh, and the presidential branch when the president has again and again repeated its support for this Bangsamoro Basic Law. In fact, any advocate of a bill would really be benefit from the fact from the that such a presidential support, mm -hmm. as we did see in some bills that passed through a very very difficult processes, including the reproductive health bill. And I would like to note here that the reproductive health bill passed, and eventually a segment of the law was declared unconstitutional. But it didn't mean that the essence of the uh, the what the RH bill sought to achieve has been lost by, uh, by uh, striking off, by the Supreme Court, striking off only a portion of that bill, of the law that has, has been passed. So in any case, uh, we welcome all of these comments. But just as an overview, I think this is what we mean in terms of what flexibilities of the Constitution may allow and what 
a constrictive or a very conservative reading of the Constitution would not allow. So definitely our basic starting point here is that if we are uh, focused on uh, a very, uh, 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 let's say, a very narrow interpretation of the Constitution without taking into context uh, the context of the times and the aspirations that are also embedded in the Constitution because precisely we have these provisions in the Constitution on regional autonomy uh, under Article 10, a special segment under a set of provisions pertaining to local government, then obviously there was an intent in the Constitution uh, to be able to address a long-standing historical problem and this is the solution that the Constitution provided us. You will not find any similar provision in all past Philippine constitutions. It is only in the 1987 constitution where there is reference to autonomous regions, autonomous and the creation of an autonomous government, which brings us to what the constitution sought to institute. What by creating two, by allowing for the creation of two autonomous regions, it meant that the constitutional framers and the people, because the people ratified the constitution, precisely allowed for a special arrangement. And this is what we are referring to now as asymmetrical. Otherwise, we will be completely symmetrical, meaning there's a national government and there's a local, there are local governments. But that is not the case. The Constitution said that in two areas of the Philippines, you will have this autonomous region. Doesn't that make it asymmetrical? You know, you have federal states. There's reference to federal states that are symmetrical and asymmetrical. S symmetrical federal systems are, are like what you find in the United States. They're all equal. States have more or less the same legislative uh, and other powers that they can institute. There is no special arrangement for a special region, which will otherwise make it an asymmetrical federal system. So here we have, you might say, we are leaning more towards the concept of a unitary system. We are not a federal system, and we need constitutional change to have a federal system. But even our unitary system is not no longer the classic, pure type of unitary system, which is a highly centralized arrangement. And precisely the 1987 Constitution sought to remedy that this very centralized political system by introducing two important concepts. The concept of devolution, which we now find in, uh, uh, applicable to all local governments under, uh, as defined by the local government code, and now also the concept of autonomy, which is precisely what we have been trying to do over time. First, starting off with the Republic Act that created the, uh, the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, and now this new Bangsamoro Basic Law. So I, I hope that conceptually we are able to distinguish uh, between, say, an associative relationship, which was struck down by the, by the Supreme Court in uh, the Mo AD, and uh, please note that they did not exactly strike down asymmetric, even though that was already a concept that you found in the Mo AD. What was struck down was the associative concept. What's a good example of an associative relationship? Puerto Rico in the United States. It's a separate state. It's two different units that have agreed to associate themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, this is different. You have a region, you only had provinces before, you create a region, you are not creating. It is not as if there is an existing separate unit which we are now associating. Uh, and, and that spells a big difference between what was struck down in the Supreme Court decision in the MOA AD and what we are saying now as an essentially asymmetric relationship where you have that kind of a special arrangement for that is being allowed in the Constitution in two places in the Philippines, one in the south, the other one in the north. Uh, I hope you don't mind, Chairman. I, Chito mentioned something that has been bugging me for a long time, and maybe I'd like to hear the representatives of the MILF now answer this. Um, is it... Is, is the BBL, as it is uh, crafted today at this very moment, no? is it really a prelude to self-rule by the Bangsamoro? I'd really like to get an answer to that question. Is there really a plan for self-rule of the Bangsamoro through BBL? 
I think the BBL clearly states that the Bank Samoro is still part of the Philippines. So, and as I mentioned in my opening um, statement, while the original position uh, of the MNLF and then the MILF uh, was independence, mm -hmm. uh, they have agreed to a compromise position. And that compromise is less than independence. So what we find in the BBL is that compromise position. The, the BBL uh, in Article 2, Section 1, uh, categorically depicts the Bangsamoro political entity as a nation state with the eminent right to self-determination. Is that a correct reading? Section, sorry. Article 2, Section 1. I think that is a, a very important concern for everyone considering the BBL right Section now. One. Oh, it or, On the Bank Samora identity. Well, anyway, the... the, the uh, well, the, there's mention of self-determination. Yes, self-determination. Even self-determination is a right that's uh, already recognized uh, for all peoples. Uh, internationally, uh, it's found in the... Uh, International Covenant on Civil Political Rights, uh, also in the other uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, uh, in the in UN Guiding Principles on in, of Indigenous Peoples. So it's not something that uh, but is it should, extraordinary. But it should not be construed as a as part of a an overall plan to uh, how shall we say. Dismember or dismember the country and secede from the republic. But if we wanted that, we could always do that. We do not need the BBL in order to assert uh, whatever form of self-determination we would want. But clearly, uh, the track is to have an autonomous region that is allowed even within the framework of the Philippine state. Thank you. Uh, Chito, is there any other question that you mentioned a while ago? Yeah, that you want them to answer to, uh, in particular, among the points you raised. Uh, uh, this was with respect to the, what I understand will be a uh, special canvas, a style of canvas for areas which are dominated by uh, Muslim uh, population and areas which do not have a dominating Muslim population. Is there I a uh, read this in the uh, Philippine uh, graphic. Is that a you know, part we of the BBL? We don't find that in the BBL. Personally, it's no, the no. first time I've heard of it also. But it was, uh, it was quoted that the panel had uh, said that. Is this uh, true? So it was not said. So we can say that the present, uh, this is not true. Yeah, yeah, frankly, we're not aware of that. Uh, it's more of a, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I think we all admit that the proposed Bangsamoro Basic Law is not a perfect document. If it's not perfect, therefore, it has imperfections. If it has imperfections, they need to be changed, corrected. Uh, that's why I think uh, it's important to have uh, these exchanges. And as we all know, sometimes there are really different, different uh, opinions. Uh, I think everybody respects all of the individual opinions. Uh, but at some point, there has to be some value judgment, judgment call of the, our legislators. Because we have also said we have to depend on the plenary powers of Congress as far as legislation is concerned. That's why there's a continuing engagement with both houses in terms of what may be the solu possible solutions. For example, that issue of associative and asymmetric. and asymmetric. Some people have suggested in order to avoid any misinterpretation, it's better to define asymmetric means this, 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 that. Uh, so that it's not equated to associative, which has been Struck declared down. unconstitutional by the Supreme. Those are the, some of the suggested solutions. Because we've been trying, we've, 
Actually, we've been uh, on a problem-solving mode rather than on a negotiating mode. Because at, at some point, knowing what the possible end goal is, I'm sure there are solutions to any of these uh, imperfections. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why that was an example in order not to equate asymmetric with associative. Because even Justice Pakaniban said, asymmetric is a no-no. So uh, one solution suggested by some is so that in order not to misinterpret it, define it. Uh, COA, I know this thing about COA, uh, again, on the problem-solving mode, it's more of a intent is, in the exercise of good governance, there is the intention of self-audit, strengthen internal controls, so that uh, disbursements of government money are properly documented, uh, validated, uh, rationalize so there's that uh, there's an the feeling is there's a need for an internal audit body to help the Bangsamoro government uh, have proper control of its expenses we have always said without prejudice to the uh, power duty function or authority of the Commission on audit it in the proposed BBL, it's called Bangsamoro Commission on Audit, but sometimes that can lead to misinterpretation as usurping the powers of COA. Yes. So it's no need to really, you can just say Bangsamoro, Bangsamoro Auditing Body, which is what it is in the first place in the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bangsamoro, something like that, uh, to make sure that you don't run afoul of the constitution. This, uh, the, the question about uh, constitutional agencies uh, being basically devolved to the Bangsamoro is one thing. The other thing that is uh, that Chito mentioned is the other big controversy is about the so-called opt-in provision. Now, the provision that allows a certain percentage of the population, if they so decide, to join the Bangsamoro later on, but like Chito pointed out, there is no opt-out provision. I'd like uh, somebody from the panel, in behalf of our readers and the people watching us over the internet, to really explain how this works. Okay. I, I first, just to clarify, the constitutional bodies cannot be devolved. Because, yes. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's not also what is in the Bangsamoro Basic Law. No, we just wanted to clarify that because there is no intent whatso in any manner whatsoever to take away any power, duty, function, or authority of COA, Civil Service yes. Commission, COMELEC, Commission on Human Rights, Ombudsman. So the, the suggestion from some parties is you have to find the proper wording just to make sure that these are auxiliary bodies uh, just to help the government. Yeah, point uh, taken. Yeah. yeah. But the second issue on the op in, op out. Yes. There is really an op out. Uh, it be, there is a statement somewhere uh, in the proposed BBL and in the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro, which basically says, which basically recognizes the, the collective democratic rights of people. In a way, it's not very, ex it's not, it does not expressly say opt out. It's a nice way of saying opt out. Uh, when you express, uh, when you recognize the democratic collective rights of people. In any case, uh, when we look at the details, opt in, opt out would be very difficult. Because what we're saying is, for any opt in or opt out, we have to follow the Constitution in terms of uh, the consent of the mother unit uh, to allow a lesser government unit to opt out, like Novaliches, to get out of Quezon City, the whole Quezon City has to agree. Yes. Uh, oh. Even Nueva Ecija, Cabanatuan City, to become a chartered city, the whole Nueva Ecija has to agree. 
what we're basically saying is, in the, for practical purposes, opting in and opting out would be very difficult. Uh, what will happen during the play visit, I think it's more or less would be a final decision of all of the existing provinces and cities, whether they want to become part of the Bangsamoro. Because everybody, even the ones include, included in the Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, has to again decide whether they want to join or not. We're hoping that every, everybody will join, but we can never preclude the fact, the, the possibility that uh, one or two of the proposed core territory may not uh, agree. Because th so, that question has been asked uh, of also of the MILF. They always say, if X province says they don't want to be part of the Bangsamoro, so be it. That's how democracy is. So, uh, uh, for example, a locality, a local government decides to opt in. Is the process of opting out, if they so decide once again, going to be as easy as opting in? We're saying it, creation, as envisioned in the Constitution, in the creation of the autonomous region, barangay, <laughs> municipalities, cities, and provinces can decide because the Constitution says geographic areas. We, we're saying it doesn't need the agreement of the mother unit. But in terms of opting in and opting out later, it would have to uh, have the consent of the mother unit. Uh, okay. That's a distinction that we have made based on a reading of the Constitution. Be before I go back to you, Chito, I I'm sure you have other questions. I'd like to hear from Joyce. I'm sure, Joyce, you have a question. Hi. Um, first, I'd like to field questions from our listeners and followers on Twitter. Uh, one of them said, can you please explain Article 16, Section 13? I understand this is on supplemental funds. And another one wanted to be enlightened if Palawan is really included in the BBL. Palawan used to be included in more ADAC. Mr. Bakani shaking his head. And what about the Malampaya share? How will that factor in? Okay. Uh, Palawan is not in the list of... Uh, places, uh, mm -hmm. provinces who would participate in the plebiscite. And, uh, but it, it was included in the original MOA AD. It was. Yes. Uh, the original MOA AD included about uh, uh, 10 provinces, but not the whole provinces, except mm -hmm. for the five who are now part of the arm. Here, it's only the same five provinces in the arm, okay. plus parts of Lanao del Norte, the six municipalities, and 39 barangays in North Cotabato and Cotabato City, Isabela City. You can see how far back the MILFs lead back in this negotiation. They agreed to a much scaled down uh, geographic area, uh, significantly reduced from the MOA AD, significantly reduced from the Tripoli Agreement that was signed with the MNLF. Tripoli Agreement 13, provinces, yeah. now 16 provinces uh, because of the new provinces that were created. That was a major compromise on the part of the uh, MLF. Now for Palawan, Palawan is not in the geographic, uh, potentially geogra ge ge geographic jurisdiction okay. of the Bangsamoro. But as, pe as, resi or as indigenous peoples who may have resided in Palawan, uh, who, may ha who coming, from, coming from Palawan and wish to be identified as Bangsamoro, this is now the identity, not the political entity, not the geographic area mm -hmm. or the scope it's of like the territorial the jurisdiction. It's like choosing a uh, cultural yes. preference. You may wish to associate yourself as an Ilocano, even mm -hmm. if you're not living in Ilocos, but there are certain requirements. Your, uh, your ancestors have lived in these places that were traditionally part of that kind of uh, uh, history. So we know that Southern Palawan, not even the whole of Palawan, was part of the Sulu Sultanate before. Uh, so that is the historical basis uh, for some people in Southern Palawan who may wish to ascribe to an identity that is called Bangsamoro. But otherwise, even in the future, opting in is hardly feasible 
in for Palawan because you have a, a requirement there that's con uh, contiguity. Mm -hmm. It's very, very far away mm -hmm. from uh, either uh, from Basilan, Sulu, Tawi, Tawi. Actually, we group Palawan under uh, uh, region, uh, region 4A, region 4A, actually, 4A right Mimaropa. now. Mimaropa. Mm -hmm. So under Luzon, yes. but it can very well be part of Visayas as well. Mm -hmm. Surely it will be of part geography. of China. Mm -hmm. So malampaya funds. That's another question. <laughs> I don't think that's under question <laughs> for Palawan, uh, thankfully, because there you have Malampaya funds, right? Yes, Malampaya, Malampaya gas, uh, the plant. Now, what is the issue there, and why is it different from what is being discussed now in the Bangsamore Basic Law? The Supreme Court issue is how uh, whether, in fact, local gov uh, the, 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 the shares of the local government. Now, it's mm -hmm. very clear that the... the Oil field is outside of the municipal waters of Palawan. Okay. And that is why the share in uh, the resources, which is the gas, is not automatically mm -hmm. applied to Palawan mm -hmm. because it is not part of its municipal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. No, the same thing will happen here in the Bangsamoro. If the uh, source of the oil is within the territorial jurisdiction of the Bangsamoro, then the sharing arrangements would apply, mm -hmm. automatically apply, especially, of course, if it's onshore rather than offshore, mm -hmm. because offshore you have to define municipal waters. In the case of uh, the Bangsamoro, there's still the concept of Bangsamoro waters, which extends municipal, the territorial jurisdiction to about seven more kilometers beyond the uh, 15 kilometer uh, uh, rule as far as municipal waters are I'm concerned. I'm glad you mentioned uh, the sharing of uh, resources uh, because another issue that keeps cropping up is about the, the sharing of revenues from uh, minerals and other resources, uh, especially because of the uh, persistent belief that the Liguasan March, March, for instance, has a lot of mineral resources, including oil, this has always been a sore point with the people who have an issue with the BBL. Uh, could you care to clear that up? Actually, gas for Liguasan Marsh. But, you know, Liguasan Marsh straddles three provinces, yes. which includes uh, provinces like uh, Sultan Kudarat and this North Cotabato, which are not going to be part of the Bangsamoro. So, which means that any any arrangement for sharing uh, in Liguasan Marsh, again, depending on where you define the location, mm -hmm. uh, according to some of the experts there, it's not where the pipeline is, but where the resource is, mm -hmm. which is underneath the ground. Yes. Then, uh, then you apply the rules, uh, either the local government code or the uh, PD, this PD pertaining to oil exploration, uh, how the sharing will actually be done across the provinces or in the Bangsamoro, if indeed it will be qualified as in the Bangsamoro. So in the Bangsamoro, the sharing is 50-50 mm -hmm. of government share from, the, uh, from uh, whatever is produced uh, in, uh, en from energy resources. From what you know so far, is there really uranium there? It is mentioned specifically, right? It's, it's true to have a listing, but uh, so far no uranium has been found in the whole country. But it is in the, in the agreement. whole country. Yeah, yes. it's a it's a metallic. Uh, it's a distinction between fossil fuel uh, as against uh, I was metallic just surprised and non-metallic when I saw minerals. It. Why specify uranium? So it made me wonder. But then that's just me. Anyway, Joyce, you have other questions. There was another question about this yeah. article. Yeah, the only thing I could find was uh, in Section 13 of Article 16, it says it's about the funding of $1 billion to the Bangsamoro Transition Authority. It says, this shall be without prejudice to any supplemental budget that may be appropriated by Congress to support the transition. I guess it's really up to Congress. If they think $1 billion is not enough, they can add to that. That's how I interpret this provision in terms of supplemental funds. Chita? Uh, before I... Uh, oh, go ahead, sir. I just want to have a little clarification no, about the term integral and inseparable part and parts. Then second, territorial. Third, prime minister. 
In DBBL, there is no term as prime minister. Mm -hmm. It's only to be headed by a chief minister. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to be clarified. But is it a parliamentary system? Yeah, parliamentary system. Does it because follow the, the same prime, rule that... Prime minister yes. is supposed to be the head of... Head of government. Government. Yes. This one, this is not the head of government. This is only a head of a... It's more autonomy. So but this will is it not follow the minister. template that Chito mentioned and that prime I minister. have already heard that if you want to basically change the government, the prime minister or in your or the minister in your case brings in his own cabinet and then through a vote of non-confidence in the parliament, the whole government can be replaced. Yeah, will right. it follow that system? We also have we also have that in the presidential form. We the recall. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot easier parliamentarily. Yeah, uh, maybe different ways. But uh, the system is quite also the same because in the presidential form, you can recall governor, you can recall maybe even the president. But in practice, we all know that how difficult that is. <laughs> oh, so Because so in a pure parliamentary system, it's very easy. Not so easy because uh, you really have to struggle uh, to, to remove a chief minister. It's not easy. You have to have a two-third vote of the total uh, members a, a, of parliament. A vote of no, no confidence it's is what they call it. A vote of no confidence, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three-fourth. Three-fourth votes. Uh, so there is no prime minister in the bank tomorrow. It's going to be headed by a chief minister only. In the second about territorial, I believe the Territory is also mentioned in the 1987 constitution, in the local government code. Mm -hmm. Why is it applied uh, in the provincial jurisdiction, uh, uh, ter territorial jurisdiction of the province of cities and barangays? So why can it not be also used by Bang Samoro? That term territory, if it is also allowed in the 1987 constitution, because in the 1987 constitution, it speaks about territorial jurisdiction of province, of cities, and municipalities. Okay. Chita. And that parts of the Republic of the Philippines, what is the difference between parts and integral part and inseparable parts? Okay. So, first of all, there's a world of a difference between territory and territorial jurisdiction. Territorial jurisdiction is to determine competence of courts and competence of the exercise of local government authority. Uh, no, no, but the term, ter if, if you're going to, the, ter the term territory as used in the BBL is different. It, uh, it taking the context of the entire uh, law. It suggests, I'm not saying that uh, that is the intention of the framers. It suggests that there is going to be, this is a prelude or a stepping stone to actual acquisition of independence, which brings us to a point that I mentioned. Uh, first, why is Malaysia into the picture? The, the historical records show that Malaysia should not be, it's not the ideal broker here, but it should be Indonesia. Because during the time of President Diosdado Makapagal, during the Manila Accord, Indonesia sided with the Philippines over the issue of uh, whether or not uh, the elections in the, the plebiscite in, in Sabah was fair or not. And Indonesia has no interest in the uh, running of the affairs in Muslim Mindanao. Mm -hmm. Why Malaysia was chosen over Indonesia should be explained to the people. And the other uh, point there, uh, going back to the point, the United States cannot be used as a reference point because federalism is not just um, the autonomy of the different states. The concept of federalism means that the, the, the federal government exercises only such powers that the United States Constitution expressly vests in it. All other government power is reserved for the states themselves. Mm -hmm. So there is really no need for, to, for autonomy there because as pointed out by President Ronald Reagan before, let us not forget that the states were there before the yes. union was even created. Yes. Puerto Rico is not even an appropriate example because like the Philippine Islands, when President McKinley 
issued the second the instructions to the second Philippine Commission, there was an explicit provision there that whenever a, uh, land is acquired by the United States, the U.S. Congress must specify if that territory can ripen into statehood. The U.S. Supreme Court has two decisions uh, in that uh, regard. That's why the Philippines can never, could never have hoped to become a, a state. U.S. state <laughs> because it was not in the federal agenda to make it a state. Okay. You can check U.S. versus Springer and other uh, okay. decided cases. Now, as for the uh, uh, in-out, there was a plebiscite already before on ARMM. Provinces said, we don't want to be part of the ARMM. Mm -hmm. Why are they being invited again to participate in another uh, exercise in futility? Okay. Go ahead, Only please. the provinces that are now in the arm will be asked. So no other new province will be asked. But let me say, uh, let me just clarify when I referred to the U.S. I was not giving an example of, uh, I know it's a federal, I was defining what symmetrical and asymmetrical mm -hmm. means. And I was saying that in different kinds of system, you may have symmetrical, meaning all the same, such as you would find in the federal system of the United States of America, or asymmetrical, which you will find, usually find in non-federal states. And non-federal states do not usually mean unitary states, precisely with states that have many autonomous regions. They create new arrangements that are most likely going to make it asymmetrical. Because uh, if you have all autonomous regions in the same standing, Spain, for instance, uh, I think it's very important that we really have a global perspective in all of this, in trying to understand uh, uh, what we are trying to put up. Spain has several autonomous regions with different types of powers each, not the same arrangement across the different autonomous regions, about 17 of them. That's a very asymmetrical arrangement. Mm -hmm. Indonesia has only few autonomous regions, Aceh, Yogyakarta, uh, uh, West, uh, Irian Jaya, West Timor, and uh, of course, uh, well, mostly these three, which makes it asymmetrical because it's not the same mm -hmm. in the rest of the, Indonesia. I, I so am, that I, is the I, concept that I have been... But I am not a lawyer, but I am no, a... But this I is am not a, really about legal arrangements. I, I, this is... Uh, I am... A, I am a, English major. And to me, what asymmetrical means is that there is no exact correspondence. Mm -hmm. There is no one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence to the rest of the country. Uh, but that has always been a problem with me as well, asymmetrical. Yung problema, yung, it, it, uh, uh, people have asked me, what does asymmetrical mean? I think I should let, I think uh, the panel should really explain well what asymmetrical That's means. That's true, and that is why, if I suggested uh, earlier, if we need to define that in the BBL, then maybe that will help address the issues. But let me just say, let me just continue. Uh, we do need to have a global perspective. Obviously, 1973 constitution, par supposedly uh, parliamentary system, is a poor example of a parliamentary system. Mm -hmm. That means, uh, and that is why I think a lot of people do not really have uh, uh, a very good idea how parliamentary systems work. Even though you create an executive branch from a legislature, the functions of the two are very different. One cannot assume the functions of the other. The executive executes laws. The parliament drafts, uh, passes the laws. Mm -hmm. These are very distinct functions. And that is why, even though, kumbaga, hinugot mo sa tadyang bayan, yung, uh, executive, uh, yung executive branch yes. mo, still, it will perform an entirely different function. So I think what yung question kanina, unfortunately, Congressman De La Cruz appears to have left us. He asked, what's the big difference between the arm and this bang Samoro? There are several game-changing features in okay. the Bangsamore Basic Law. And precisely one is the system of the structure of government, which is this parliamentary form of government, which we are saying from our a reading, a liberal reading of the Constitution, when Congress was mandated to define the, the structure of government in the uh, Bangsamoro, then it had the power to define that. Meaning, the Constitution said the structure of government must be this and that. Actually, local governments also may be uh, structured differently. It, was, it is up to Congress to structure local governments, and they did that in the local government code. And they stuck to what was familiar to us, which is you direct directly, uh, they, they elect directly your, uh, your officials, 
instead of having that kind of uh, a system where you have a layered, layered election system, a direct and then an indirect uh, election system in defining who your chief executives will be. So it is very well in the power of Congress to define that. And I think our constitutional framers had the wisdom not to define it themselves in the Constitution, but allow the future Congress to precisely define the structure of government. Now, why is that a game changer? In this case, a parliamentary system will be more representative, it will be more democratic, and it also expands the, the arrangements in terms of proportional representation. The only proportional representation system in our electoral system now is the party list. Mm -hmm. There's no other feature. And it's an innovative function. Uh, it's an innovative, Congressman De La Cruz would not be here with us if we didn't have this proportional representation system that was, be in, was introduced in the form of the party list system. Here in the proposed Bangsamora Basic Law, we are expanding the PR system. The proposal is to have 50% of the seats party list, which means the capture of elective posts by traditional politicians. The political dynasties is limited now to the geographic representation or the congressional districts that we are familiar with, in, in this case, the assembly districts or now the Bangsamoro parliamentary districts. And what else? So what? that is a game changer. It will enable a more representative uh, system, political system in the Bangsamoro. It's, not, it's bearing away from that winner-take-all system where the regional governor who is elected simply by a plurality of votes, even if it's only 20% of the votes, get to uh, be able to basically uh, establish political control. And that is how we have uh, perpetuated the strongman rule in many of our localities here. It will have to be more democratic, more representative, and more based on coalitions and alliances, which means it also could allow uh, disenfranchised groups like the MNLF, the MILF, to, more, uh, to be able to contest elections on a more even level, you know, a more even okay. playing field. Okay. Which but, you do not have, you cannot establish in a winner take yeah. all. But you mentioned other game changers. That's features. right. Maybe fiscal what autonomy else? is a big game changer, and I can, I can ask another member of this panel to expound on that. But a, a question on fiscal autonomy is just how much and who will pay for the bill. That always comes up, diba? Right? Who, who, how much will it cost us, meaning the entire country, and how long are we going to have to pay for that, given that uh, I think the, the provisions for revenue raising within Bangsamoro already provide sufficient funds for its own subsistence? Well, in the fiscal autonomy article, it says that the Bangsamoro will have uh, automatic appropriation, meaning mm -hmm. it will have something like an era. That is already there right now. Yes. But no, in no, the BBL. For the, for the ARMM, no. that is already there? No. The How about the, treated... what they call the, what they call that? They have a term for it. Eh. Yung parang, parang items that are already uh, included right now. Well, mm. well Never the mind. ARM is treated like uh, any other national government agency. Mm -hmm. It has to go to Congress and submit a uh, budget proposal in accordance with a uh, budget ceiling dictated by the DBM. Mm -hmm. So in the Bank Samoro, we will have a different way of getting the subsidy from government, mm -hmm. and that's through automatic appropriation. So the BBL uh, provides for the formula uh, which will be implemented in order to arrive at an amount that will be given to the Bank Samoro annually. Okay, so there's... Uh, if we can give that to the barangays, uh, the municipalities, cities, and provinces, which are not even categorized as autonomous regions, uh, why can we not give it to the Bank Samoro? So that uh, it will have more control of how it will use it fu its funds, uh, make its own budget in accordance to the needs that... P people keep on talking about 75 billion, seb uh, in other places, they say it's as low as 30 billion or something like that. What is the real score as far as the appropriations to the Bank Samoro is concerned in BBL? Yeah, let me discuss that in more detail because in my opening uh, comments, I basically stated no way is it 70 billion, no way is it 60 billion, no way is it 50. 
No way is it 40, no way is it 30, no way is it 20. The range, depending on the interpretation, is between seven to 10. Uh, let me go into more details. Special Development Fund, seven billion first year, two billion a year for the next five years. Six years, 17 billion. One billion, Bangsamoro Transition Authority Fund, 18. 18 divided by six, three. That's it. Uh, when we say Bangsamoro government, we're really saying Bangsamoro government because internal revenue allotment is, goes directly to the barangay, municipality, province, city. It does not go to the Bangsamoro government. Nation, DPWH spending on national road, it will be budgeted by DPWH and spent by DPWH. Oh. CCT of the SWD, of course, there are many poor also in, in the arm, in the Bangsamoro. The SWD will spend, will budget for it and will spend for it, will be accountable for it. What we're basically saying, we hear 70 billion, 75 billion. What we're saying is, even if you forget about the Bangsamoro today, 60 billion of that will continue anyway. Uh, so we're saying, depending on the interpretation, we can, we're saying anything for the combatants and their communities is spent by the national agencies. This not that even go to the Bangsamoro, this is part of the normalization process in terms of socioeconomic, uh, education, uh, health and livelihood for the combatants and their communities. That doesn't go to the Bangsamoro. It's spent by the Department of Agriculture, Department of Social Welfare so, and Development, etc. So, Secretary, what you're saying is funds that have been allocated and spent and uh, that are earmarked for spending by national government agencies in the proposed Bangsamoro area should not be included yeah, in, in the cost of uh, subsidizing the I think Bank what government. confuses people, we admit it can be confusing. It's the first time the word black grant is used. Yun, that was uh, the term I was looking for. When you black say grants. black grant, it can mean additional. What we've been saying all along, it's not additional, it's a replacement of the annual subsidy to the arm today. Today, the subsidy to the arm, 24.3, I can explain the details of that. 24.3 in the 2015 General Appropriations Act. Using the formula, the 24.3 will be replaced by a number close to 27 in 2016, 27 billion. So the 27 billion replaces the 24.3. And when you look at the increase, it's about 11%, which is not abnormal. Uh, as you, you will probably notice, when the budget for 2016 is proposed, it will probably be close to 3 trillion. 2015 is about 2.7 trillion. Uh, so you're saying, the, just to recap, what the Bangsamoro is going to get is what ARMM is going to get anyway. In a, just on the, as, as, on the annual... Uh, yes, on the annual expenditures yeah. earmarked for the region. It will be replaced by a formula which will give you 27 billion to the Bangsamoro. The era will go direct to the province, city, municipality, barangay. The PWH, they will hold the money, they'll spend it for national road. NIA, in case there is any irrigation, national irrigation, what, that's what we're saying. Incremental funding, which, which is additional funding, by any stretch of the imagination, it cannot be more than 10. Maybe you uh, should not have called it a black grant. I think it's the uh, <laughs> first time it's uh, being used. That's why it can lead to confusion. It, 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 it sounds cause like there's this block of money and it's going to be granted to them. Para bang yeah, it, it's basically a term used in many other places. Uh, 
if it if the name has to be changed just to make it clear uh, I have no problem with that either yeah, walang ano eh. pero si Chito also mentioned something Saka I hope you don't ano yung ano lang just to show the intent to be self-sufficient any future uh, sharing of revenue what we're saying is anything that goes to the bank Samoro will be deducted from the black grant it's very clear in the provision because they're saying if we discover something there and we will get a share, don't give us the money, deduct it from our share of the black mm. grant. Uh, okay. It's very, because it's to show the intent that hindi naman forever dependent on yeah. the national. Okay. Okay. Uh, hopefully after a few decades, it will be self-sufficient or even contribute to other regions. That's okay. the basic pero, intent. Pero Secretary, si Chito mentioned something and I'm also interested in this and a lot of people have asked me about this. The role of Malaysia. First of all, si Congressman Jonat uh, already pointed out that the MILF, according to his uh, speech a while ago, his statement, was actually against the entry of Malaysia. Ah, oh, no, no, that's not from Jonat, no? But I remember seeing reports that the MILF itself was against the entry of Malaysia before when they were making Tama uh, Bako Joyce, when they were uh, making exploratory moves in, uh, in the Maguindanao area. Can you explain that and frame the question? Actually, what I remember is that at one point, the government was studying whether to replace Malaysia because there was issue on whether it was really, you know, uh, uh, brokering the peace talks in good faith. And that the MILF was against the entry of Malaysia at a uh, certain point in time? Para may, may concern lang dun sa whether they would, because of the Saba. The Saba situation. Yeah, I explained that also in the opening remarks that the reason uh, Malaysia is involved as the facilitator is uh, President uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo requested the then Prime Minister Mahathir to have Malaysia as the facilitator. We honored that commitment. It's one Philippine government. Uh, as you have seen in the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bank Samoro, we have recognized all previous agreements of government because there's only one Philippine government. Uh, any past actions of past presidents Mm. We have recognized. In fact, it's all detailed uh, in the comprehensive but, agreement of the Bank Samoro. It's more just because people may think Malaysia in, imposed itself on us. No, we requested them. But, but when you sat, uh, when, when the new administration sat down and uh, made, composed its own uh, peace negotiating body, did that co not concern you, the fact that Malaysia was in a situation with us over the claim, the long-time claim to Sabah? But, uh, the only thing I can say is uh, because it, it's something very, uh, handled by diplomatic channels. The only thing I, we can say is uh, we continue to abide by uh, previous agreements of previous governments. Yeah, there, was no, there was no way we could get out of having Sabah as the... the uh, Facilitator, is that what you are saying? A Malaysia, you mean? A Malaysia, Malaysia, I mean. I know what happened, but... <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course, there. it's possible because it will have to, to have replaced uh, Malaysia way back in 2010. Uh, we did our due diligence there. But uh, we do have our uh, diplomatic relations, uh, not only with Malaysia, but also with the other prospective countries. Mm -hmm that could have replaced Malaysia as the facilitator. And at the end of the day, uh, for uh, uh, good diplomatic relations to be sustained, we worked it out, but we changed the rules, some of the rules on how uh, the facilitation is un actually undertaken mm -hmm. to ensure that kind of uh, integrity of the process. But I guess at the end of the day, what we can find, what we, we, we can say is that uh, the facilitator proved prove himself to be an honest broker. You know, that and uh, no decision was uh, undertaken simply because uh, that was what uh, Malaysia wanted. Uh, certainly, Malaysia did not interfere in any of the substantive uh, agreements that we have achieved. Okay, ang problema natin, and I will be frank, uh, the rest of us, 
the panel members excluded, not all of them. The rest of us have actually to come up with a newspaper for tomorrow. In fact, based on what we talked about today in part, we would love to continue this. You know, we could talk about, um, personally lang, no? I could sit down with you guys and talk about this until nightfall at least. No? Wala pang ano yan. Wala pang dinner. No? Dinner not included. But the thing is, uh, I think we kind of run. I'm sure you have other stuff to do. I'm sure we have. We have to wrap up the discussion now. And I'd like to ask all of you seated here in front of our audience and the people watching through the internet to give us closing statements. Ito na. Tell us what you really think. But please, if you can, make it as short as you can. Uh, from the side of the uh, Peace negotiating panels, please. Okay, I will start. Uh, well, basically, um, I think uh, obviously, marami po po tayong kailangan pag-usapan and we do need to go uh, into a lot of details, especially once the process reopens in Congress. And it's not easy, it's a very thick law. And uh, we, we, we understand that the people who were involved from the beginning probably know what they mean, but a third party, a new person reading the text would interpret it differently, especially because you do have to correlate different parts of the text to really get what it means. I mean, a single sentence cannot represent everything there, or even as a single provision, it will have to be correlated with other provisions. So that's part of the difficulty. But at the end of the day, we do need a good law. We need a law that could not be that will not be interpreted 100 different ways, especially by our Supreme Court justices. So we are here to engage uh, our Congress and our public to come up with that good law. Without, but uh, our appeal is that there are uh, certain purposes, aspirations that are embedded in this law. They are primarily intended to, so, so, uh, to provide that kind of uh, justice that, uh, uh, that, will, uh, that will operationalize meaningful autonomy for this segment of the population. And they are intended to provide a good institution because what the law basically does is to create a new political institution that will be the vehicle for democratic politics and governance in the region. Especially because you do have to correlate different parts of the text to really get what it means. I mean, a single sentence cannot represent everything there, or even as a single provision, it will have to be correlated with other provisions. So that's part of the difficulty. But at the end of the day, we do need a good law. We need a law that could not be inter that will not be interpreted 100 different ways, especially by our Supreme Court justices. So we are here to engage uh, our Congress and our public to come up with that good law. Without, but uh, our appeal is that there are uh, certain purposes, aspirations that are embedded in this law. They are primarily intended to, so, so, uh, to provide that kind of uh, justice that, uh, uh, that, will, uh, that will operationalize meaningful autonomy for this segment of the population. And they are intended to provide a good institution because what the law basically does is to create a new political institution that will be the vehicle for democratic politics and governance in the region. So yung po ang ating pakiusap, sana po ay maging fair and accurate po yung reporting dito kasi I can cite many examples where reporting has really gone bad on what is in the law, uh, especially with reference to statements that are just repeated and again and again without further investigation as to the veracity of the statement or maybe even just a little, you know, asking for proofs. For instance, let me just go through the passport issue. Yung pong passport issue, napaka-sticky niyan. But where did it all start? It started with a Facebook, Facebook report, yeah. which was never validated. And all this time, we have not seen any proof that what was claimed in this Facebook account is actually true. And yet, it seems to be the truth. And what we need to do now is to prove that it is otherwise. So, ganun po yung sanang gusto natin makita sa ating mass media, yung pong ganun klaseng responsible reporting. You quote one person saying that Malaysia and the MILF have already agreed to, uh, to uh, a, Ligua a deal in Liguazan March. That's only a statement. Where's the proof? So we hope that before these uh, statements are being reported and repeated, 
uh, many times that uh, actually further investigation will be done. Otherwise, we will not get over this fog. Fog coming from Mama Sapano, fog coming from that history of biases and prejudices against a segment of our population. So, thank you very much. And we thank Manila Standard thank you for very providing much. us with this opportunity. It's now the, simply the standard, but it's okay. <laughs> We move over to my friend here and our columnist in the standard, Chito Vesilia. Your closing sta statement, please, sir. Uh, so, thank you. I will not uh, belabor everybody for, with a repetition of what I stated. Just like to iterate that, uh, you know, it's not a perfect document, but it cannot be unconstitutional. That's one. Number two, a liberal interpretation of the Constitution is not warranted when there are uh, very serious national interests at stake. Now, they say that uh, these are statements, etc. The uh, statement that the parliamentary form of government is more democratic is also a statement. Okay, if they say that uh, the founding fathers, or the ones who drafted the Constitution in their wisdom, did not provide for a uh, uh, left Congress to define what uh, kind of government would be for the autonomous region, if the, doesn't it logically follow if the, these uh, drafters had seen the beauty or the inherent democratic uh, nature of the parliamentary government. Why didn't they impose a parliamentary government for the national level? No, the people who drafted the constitution created a presidential form of government for the national level. And it is, it, it's constitutionally absurd to entertain the idea that uh, a presidential form of government should work for the uh, national level and a more ideal parliamentary form of government should work for an autonomous region. Medyo malabo po yun. And of course, um, a parliamentary government in all uh, discussions in constitutional law uh, presupposes the application in a local scene, not an, uh, for a national scene, not for a local government level. So, um, um, we may have been adversarial this uh, afternoon, uh, it is not intended to be hostile to our friends over there. It's just that sometimes, uh, you know, when uh, a divisive issue is uh, at hand, some people get to be a little bit more zealous and passionate in their uh, delivery. And uh, nothing uh, wrong with that. Uh, in that uh, instance, uh, our hope here is not to start quarrels. Uh, I will echo the statement of our colleagues there that uh, there is no there is no monopoly of uh, good ideas no monopoly of uh, truth, but ultimately, I think before we come up with something serious, the public has a right to know, and I think this is the objective uh, well met by our uh, activity this uh, afternoon. Thank you very much, Chito. I return to the panel on my right. Thank you to Standard for inviting us here. And thanks also to media practitioner for being here with us. To the statement that uh, no BBL, there will be war. I, I wish to deny that. The that, president that, himself said words to that effect, I think. Yes. There well, will anyway, be no BBL, you start counting body bags. I don't think case, we have to verify that. <laughs> maybe from the president, but from our side, from the MILF, our chairman always say, say that uh, regardless of what form the BBL comes, we will always pursue peace in a peaceful manner. And then second, uh, there was that publicity about saying that uh, Chairman Murad uh, stated that trust has been eroded. I'd like to also issue a rejoinder on that, that the statement of the chairman was not eroded but affected. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you. On a personal note, I am so glad that we can have several hours of discussion on Mama Sap, on, on the BBL, and Mama Sapano never came up. You see, we can do this. Go ahead, attorney. Well, um, don't now, make I, me look like to, a liar by suddenly going into Mama Sapa. Yes, I want okay, to do that. <laughs> because it's been connected to the BBL. And we, uh, the message really that I want to put out is that we should not. Because Mama Sapa now shows us how bad and ugly war is. 
and that is the situation that we want to uh, not to, to prevent. Uh, we know the BBL will not uh, eradicate uh, all the violence that uh, could happen in, a, in an area uh, where there are still armed groups. But there are efforts uh, as found in the BBL and outside of the BBL and part of the agreement which would address these matters. So um, we hope we can move forward and um, Passing the BBL, a good BBL that is uh, uh, in accordance with the agreement would be something that we want to see in the near future. Thank you very much. Secretary, a few words from you. No, I, I really just want uh, to thank all of you for giving us this opportunity. Uh, we'll continue to be actively engaged uh, with the public, with the media, and with our legislators to make sure that whatever law gets passed uh, is something good enough for all. Uh, it's not for the interest of anybody to have this law declared unconstitutional uh, because it will really just uh, disrupt the whole timetable. It's for the interest of everybody to have this law constitutional almost 100%. Uh, so we just have to work together on this. Uh, in, my, in our case, we have, uh, we are, I'm really from the private sector. Uh, we have worked without a BBL for the last 18 years. We have renewed contracts for the next 20 years without a BBL. Uh, because as I said, uh, you cannot legislate peace. Uh, you just have to work with, together with everybody. Uh, we have a good example of what we do there. Uh, not a single day of interruption lost over 18 years due to labor or peace and order uh, among 2,500 people. Uh, and we're very competitive uh, in terms of the banana business. Uh, we can compete with any plantation in the Philippines or in the world. That's in the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao. Thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of the standard. And uh, I'm glad all of you could come. On behalf of the management and the staff, um, I'd like to thank the people who helped us put up the first forum. And uh, who knows, maybe the next forum will still be on BBL. I don't know. Maybe we'll find something else. But the issue continues to be controversial. And I'm sure there's still a lot to be said and done as far as the BBL is concerned. Good afternoon, my name is Jojo Robles. Thank you from The Standard. Thank you.